Hello and welcome to the John Ark Show. Today we're going to interview reality TV star and airplane repo agent Nick Popovich, who is one of the stars of Discovery Channel's TV show called Airplane Repo. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel for free. You can also like, comment, and follow us. We're going to have a lot of great celebrity interviews coming up, so make sure to click on the notification bell so you can be notified every time we upload a new episode. I'd also like to tell you about hollywoodiscalling.com. It's a great service that allows you to purchase live phone calls from your favorite celebrities, so check them out. It's something you can buy for yourself or as a gift for somebody you know. There are more than 100 celebrities to choose from and the calls begin at 1995, so give it a try. Hollywoodiscalling.com. Now, let's say hello to Nick Popovich. Hello, Nick. Welcome to the John Ark Show. How are you today, sir? I'm well, thank you. And you? I'm really good. Thank you. So, Nick, you are one of the stars of a reality show on the Discovery Channel called Airplane Repo that people just love. How much of a thrill was it for you the first time you went out and repoed an aircraft? Uh, the first time was was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It was a big thrill. We repo two seven forty sevens. Did you say seven forty seven or seven thirty seven? Seven forty sevens. Interesting. Is there a quantum difference uh, in in complications and in logistics between repoing a seven forty seven and maybe a seven twenty seven or seven thirty seven? Is there a dramatic difference? Depends on the situation, what country you're in, what continent you're on. Um, access to fuel. There's a lot that, you know, you could repo a 747 sometimes in Africa easier than you can get a 727 in Columbus. Now, do owners who, who know they're being repoed, do they deliberately empty the tanks when the plane is, uh, is not, not being used? We've had dry tanks. We've had instruments removed, altimeters. Um, they'll try a little bit and they'll pull the batteries out. <laughs> so, uh, how many thousands of gallons do you have to purchase on site in order to assure that you can get out of there without any problems? Uh, you know, it depends where you're at. Uh, you know, a seven five, a seven four seven holds fifty thousand gallons. So, interesting. Um, you know, it, it depends on what you're doing. Um, we're right now looking at, at just today, we're, we're kind of in a crisis mode here. We've got three wide bodies to uh, get out of South America, and we're trying to figure it all out right now. Now, a wide body meaning 757? Mm, larger. It's a newer airplane. I would say like an A350 or 787. Wow. All right. So uh, did your business increase dramatically when the economy took a dive during the pandemic? Um. Actually, we stayed about even. Interesting. Um, the repossession went up a little bit, but our other businesses went down. Our valuation and our liquidation, those businesses took a little bit of a hit. Now, I've heard from some uh, repo agents that a lot of uh, banks and, and, and owners have expressed a reluctance to repo planes during the pandemic simply because it looks bad. Are you seeing that phenomena or not really that much? I, well, I haven't seen it with all the banks and, and institutions we work with around the world. Gotcha. Um, I think a lot of them, a lot of people say they're reluctant to only because there's nothing to do with the airplane. The market is down. They just don't want to pay the storage. Oh, that's And we actually recommend as long as the uh, operator or owner is insuring it and maintaining it, you leave it with them until things turn around. Interesting. Work interesting. something out. Interesting. Uh, what was the first plane you ever repossessed? Do you recall what the model? 740. That's the one you started out with. Right. Interesting. Interesting. Was that a domestic or an offshore repossession? Uh, offshore, uh, Asia. You mind if I ask which country? Uh, Sri Lanka. Interesting. Interesting. What percentage of the time do delinquent owners simply surrender their planes to the banks and what percentage of the time do you have to hunt them down and, uh, and, and get that plane back? Um, you know, when we get called in, the bank is already 
tried to work out something to surrender the airplane. So the ones we know about, the owners refused to surrender. Um, a lot of times I will call the operator and say, look, we're going to get your airplane. You're going to end up paying the cost. You want to make it easy on yourself. You can just tell me where it's at and leave it. I'll come get it. Um, every once in a while, we'll get a guy that says, okay. So what are some of the great lengths that plane owners have gone to to conceal the aircraft from you? Oh, we've had, had guys um, leave at night without a flight plan and hide the airplanes. We had one who uh, was in West Palm. The owner flew it to Fairhope's uh, Alabama, thought he was going to hide it there. We found it within 24 hours. Uh, we've had them take them out of the country. We've had them parked in the islands. You know, it, it, they try all kinds of things. They, they lock their hangers like that's going to stop us. Um, Do they ever yeah. change their tail numbers to try to confuse you? We don't see that too often. I don't think I've seen that more than twice. That's a felony. And, uh, you know, most, most airplane owners don't want to get charged with a felony. Have you ever tried to repo a plane that, uh, that the owner deliberately sabotaged? You know, for example, we've had people tell us that some of the owners will put flammable cloth in the engine compartment to try to, you know, set the whole thing on fire if somebody steals it. I, you know, I don't know who you're talking to, but I will tell you it's BS. Okay. No owner's going to risk killing somebody over an airplane. Um, you know, we've got almost 2,000 repos. We're at 1,980 something right now. And we've never had somebody sabotage an airplane that would cause loss of life or damage to the airplane. We've had them remove instruments, but, you know, it's very clear when you look at the instrument panel, the instrument's gone. We've had them do things like take a tire off, uh, but they're not going to do something that stupid. Um, I guess that's the difference between somebody that actually repos airplanes and somebody that fakes it. And somebody that what? Fakes it. Gotcha. So generally speaking, how many planes do you estimate are repossessed each year in the, in the U.S.? What would you estimate? Um, not counting small single engine airplanes, talking, uh, turbine, turbine helicopters and business and commercial, probably about 75 to a hundred. Okay. And if you throw on the small planes, you know, we don't deal with that. So okay. I really couldn't even begin to guess. Gotcha. So my contacts tell me, uh, my contacts in the DEA tell me that a lot of privately owned planes and jets are being stolen now and used by the cartels uh, to transport drugs on one-way smuggling runs. And then when they're done, they just ditch them in the jungle. Um, have you ever had, have you ever been contracted to fly down to South America to repossess a plane that's been stolen by, uh, by the cartels or somebody else? We've been in that situation once or twice. We've also been in a situation where um, an airline operating in uh, Ecuador had to do a forced landing on a drug strip. And we had to go recover the airplane from the drug strip. So that was uh, an interesting time. So, how do you do that without getting your brains blown out? Because I'm assuming a drug strip is surrounded by guys with AKs. Generally, they are. Um, you just have to talk your way in. You have to tell okay. them what you're there for. Um, you know, they have to believe you're not DEA or some other agency. Uh, have you ever had a plane owner try and bribe you into not taking their plane? Uh, we probably have, um, you know, they offer all kinds of incentives, uh, not necessarily a bribe, but you'll get there and they'll say, well, give me an hour. I'm going to wire the money to the bank or whatever, you know, their story is for the day. Hmm. Um, so when a repo, uh, when a, when you repo a plane from an owner that hasn't been maintained for a few years, how expensive can it be to repair if, uh, if it's been really neglected? Um, depending on the size of airplane and, and, and 
and, and the aircraft itself, uh, it can run into the millions of dollars. Interesting. Um, Do the owners ever put in hidden kill switches or alarms or other devices in the planes to prevent them from being stolen or repoed? Well, there's security systems that you can install, but they're not hidden. Okay. The problem is for that type of equipment to be on the airplane, it has to be installed under what's known as an STC, a supplemental type certificate. So you have to do the electrical load analysis and make sure it's not going to interfere with anything on the airplane. And so that STC is going to have to be part of the logbook, so the owner is going to know it. By the way, you mentioned that your first repo was a 747. What would you estimate the value of that plane to be when you repoed it at the time? At the time, the airplane was probably worth $32 million. Okay. So walk me through the logistics of repoing a 747. Uh, are there additional security concerns? I, I'm imagining you probably have to hire two pilots instead of one. Um, what are the additional layers uh, of, of challenges that, uh, that come into play with a, a plane that, that enormous? Well, there's several. First, you have to worry about the location and how you gain access. And understand that our most of our repos, I would say 95% are self-help, which means we don't have a court order. You said self-help? Yes. And self-help means that we have under the terms of what the lease or the, the mortgage document, we have the right to take the airplane in the event of a default. Um, but to spare the cost of going to court and posting a bond, we do what's known as self-help, which gives us that right as long as we don't breach the peace. Hmm. So breaching the peace would be, uh, you know, somebody asking you to stop and not stopping, fighting with somebody. Any of that would be a breach of the peace, and I could get sued as well as my client. Hmm. So don't most planes have some kind of transponder on them that, that allows the authorities to know where they are? Or is that something that delinquent owners can uh, shut off very easily? No, the, the transponder and now ADSB tracks the airplanes pretty precisely. Uh, and it's illegal to disconnect them after 9-11, especially. The problem is, is that information is not publicly available. So the FAA or Eurocontrol will have it. And they have no obligation to give it to you, no matter what the case is. So not even the banks themselves can, can pay for that information? No. Interesting. What percentage of the time do plane owners get violent with you guys? In 2000 repos, I think I've had it five times. Oh, really? Well, understand, I do self-help. So the, the one thing I don't want is to see the owner. Because, right. first of all, when you talk about getting violent, um, that's a breach of the peace. I can be sued, my client can be sued, and for big dollars. So why am I going to risk getting sued for what? And, and, you know, I know it makes good TV, but it's just so unrealistic that any bank that would be doing business with them would run the other way. What's first the of all, I got to... Insurance. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I doubt they could get insurance. Right. Um, so, what is the name of your company? And are you the largest uh, airplane repo company in the U.S.? Um, the name of the company is Sage Popovich, and as far as I know, we're the largest in the world. And I think that, interesting. Uh, interesting. That everybody will tell you that. Knowing everything that you know about plane ownership, what do you think of planes as an investment? Are they a wise investment or are they as bad as boats? You know, the interesting thing about planes is there's a natural cycle to them. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, 747SP that in the 70s sold for 25 or $30 million new. Um, years later would bring 50 or 60 million after collecting rents for 15 years. And then all of a sudden they fell off the cliff and you couldn't sell one. We sold, we had two come back out of China. We sold one in uh, one year and I think it was 2000 or 1999, sold it for $16 million. 
sold the sister ship that came back a year later for four, and we're lucky to get it. Is that a function uh, entirely of market conditions, or is it more a function of the number of hours on the engines, or is it a variety of factors? What causes these massive price swings? Generally, what causes the massive price string swings are a major event in the world. Uh, Chernobyl. Okay. Uh, you know, the, swine, the, the flu in Asia, uh, 9-11, the Gulf War. Those things disrupt traffic patterns. Airplanes start getting parked and prices drop. So let's say you do repo a 747 from China. It comes back here and the price, the market prices have dropped so significantly that the bank doesn't want to sell it at this time because they're hoping maybe it'll increase. What does it cost to store a plane like that on a monthly basis? If you put it into a, an approved long-term storage program, it's about 25000 a month, not counting on insurance. All right. Uh, is it wise to purchase a repossessed plane or is such a plane more likely to have all sorts of mechanical problems uh, because it may not have been maintained pro uh, properly? Uh, my standard answer is with any airplane, you do a, a quality pre-purchase. Mm -hmm. You send the airplane to an approved shop, let them go through the airplane, spend the thirty dollars or $40,000 to do it, have them go through the logbooks, make sure the tags are there, prove that the parts are valid, and then you get a good airplane. Mm -hmm. um, and you make your offer subject to that. You know, the logbooks are mentioned frequently uh, on your show. And uh, something I wondered about, let's say a plane's worth a million dollars and the log books are missing. You guys look, you cannot find them. I understand there can be a 25 to a 50% decrease in the value of that plane. And that you then have to go through a process of some sort to, to recertify the, the maintenance of the plane. Does that mean you have to go item by item through all the required steps in, in that maintenance schedule? Or is it just some an abbreviated version of that. No, it's um, there's three things you have to go through. One is the maintenance inspection schedule itself. You have to zero it out back to the heaviest check. But more importantly, engines, if you can't prove that they've been, been operated in an approved storage program, they have to go for overhaul. Now, when I said overhaul, if you don't have the log books and prove the life limited parts in the engine, they have to be replaced. So on a CFM 56, for example, the life limited parts alone are $2.3, $2.4 million today. What can it cost to, uh, to do an overhaul on a 747 engine? Uh, assuming it's a, a CF 680C2, uh, the overhaul is about $3.5 million if you're not replacing the life limited parts. Per engine, of course. Per engine, yes. Interesting. Uh, are they going to make another season of airplane repo? Do you know? I don't know. Are there any countries like Mexico or Iran that will not do re that you'll not do repos in because it's just too dangerous? Um, there are countries I won't go back to. Uh, not be that I personally won't go back to. Some of my people will go. Uh, we. Mexico is a tough one because there's no self-help. You've got to go through a court process there. The law does not allow self-help repos. Hmm. Um, countries I won't go back to are Haiti, uh, the Congo. Um, can, you, can you tell us what happened in those countries that caused you to lose future interest in them? In 1986, I ended up in a Haitian prison for seven days for trying to repo an airplane. And the only reason that I got out without a big bail and, and paying a bunch of fines was the coup of Baby Doc. Mm. And during the coup, they just opened the jail cells. Mm. And so I don't know. I doubt that they're computerized enough or sophisticated enough. But I don't want to take the chance to go back that they still know my name. Right. Uh, Rancic takes my airplane down and does a lot of, especially after the earthquake, does a lot of charity work down there. We've built some schools and stuff, but I won't go back. Has being on the show dramatically improved your company's business? 
It actually hurt it. Really? Yeah. Why is that? Um, banks don't like the publicity. Interesting. Um, actually, we, we've got, I think, eight or nine episodes in the can that we're not showing because the bank said that they don't want them shown because the tail number can be tied back to them. Can't you guys simply black out the, uh, the tail number on the screen? We can, but, you know, as, as the bank said, type of airplane, the location you're in, and the paint job, people that live there are going to know the airplane. Where can people find you and your company online? www.sage-popovich.com. Nice. Well, Nick, it's been a real pleasure having you on the John Art Show. I want to wish you continued success and tell you that you're always welcome back on the show. On the show. Anytime. Bye-bye. Pleasure meeting you. Bye. Pleasure meeting you, sir. I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. Thank you again for watching. And I want to tell you that we're going to have more great celebrity interviews and more breaking news stories coming up in the future. So we encourage you to subscribe to our channel for free and click on the notification bell so you can get notified every time we post a new story. Thank you very much, and we shall see you soon.